Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be talking about the Apple TV Plus series, Loot. We are joined today by writer, showrunners, and executive producers, Alan Yang and Matt Hubbard. And I wanted to start by, by asking a little bit about the way in which you've brought us into the story, because we come straight into that first episode, and we get to see an event with this couple, and then we get to see the immediate breakup. And I was interested in, in how you wrote the dialogue for a scene like that, because that's kind of your, your way to introduce us to both of these characters and to also try and give us as much exposition position about their relationship as possible, even just within those first few minutes of the show. Um, and so how did you set about creating a, a scene like that and really trying to give the audience as much immediate connection, particularly to Maya Rudolph's character, Molly, just in those first few minutes of the show? Uh, great question. Yes, very difficult. The beginning of <laughs> any episode, like, how are we going to let everyone know who this person is, you know, why you like them, what the uh, what what their struggles are, you know, I think for us, I think Al and I, when we were writing it, we wanted to do two things early on. One is show that the character of Molly has has been in her rich person bubble for probably too long. Uh, and that's where we sort of came up with the idea of her taking a tour of this yacht. And we wanted that to be just sort of, she's at the 1% of the 1% of the 1% of wealth and what that does to you. Uh, but I think it was also very important to us to show that there's a human being under there that is going through things that we can understand so that anybody can understand. So we also had that scene with Adam Scott with the character of John, where they talk a little bit about her marriage and where she's at and how she's feeling some vulnerability, you know? So it was kind of like, how do we make you understand some of the flaws this person has, but also the great person who's like underneath it, who kind of wants to come out. And that's kind of the journey of the show in a nutshell. Yeah, and, and just to piggyback on what, what Matt was saying, pilot is always the most difficult episode to write, right? You're setting so many things in motion. You're setting up who the characters are, what the world is, who you're supposed to care about, what relationships are there for you. And yeah, the other specific challenge I think in this show was we wanted to convey that Maya's character, Molly, is just having the beginning of an inkling that she wishes she had established more of a life for herself and more of a presence and more of her own personality, her own life. She wanted sort of her own purpose for lack of a better word. And so we wanted to sort of see that without making it too obvious when exactly, when, you know, obviously she finds out her husband is, is having an affair. So um, that, those were kind of the challenges and we did it as hopefully as, 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 uh, as quickly and efficiently as possible while getting you into the, the meat of the story. You did. And, and, you know, and then there's that moment where we have that really great montage. We get to see her kind of recovering from the immediacy of the breakup and things being a little bit messy, mistaking someone for staying falling in a pool. Um, but I actually really like the fact that story wise, you, you bring her character forward by a few months. So she's gone through a lot of the process of grieving. She's gone through a lot of those emotions and, and you've brought her to a space that's much more interesting with a lot more to explore because she's obviously still going to have moments where she feels that's a relationship and a marriage she was in for a long time. There's still going to be anger at times, but that's not the whole thing. There's still comedy and moving forward in different ways and finding out who she is. And, and so when did you realize that for the crux of, of the entire season and the arc that you wanted to tell, it was actually really important to pull us forward story-wise from the immediacy of the breakup after showing it to that point to give us a lot more richness with what you can explore? Yeah, I think it's exactly like you said, it was very strategic, right? Um, you know, again, it was a very tricky pilot to break in some ways because there's a lot of premise to set up um, because you want to see the breakup. You want to see the divorce. That's so juicy. You want to see who she was basically before all of this story happens. So that was important. But then you also don't want to necessarily abandon the comedy of what happens right after. Right. You let you have Maya Rudolph, one of the great comedic actresses of our time. So you want to see her do that crazy stuff. You want to see her partying in Berlin and, and, and Phuket and then, you know, falling in a pool, as you said. By the way, those cities changed constantly. Like our production designer, like, we're like, what can you build? What can we use with the effects and all this and costumes and, 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 and BG and all that stuff? But I think it's exactly what you said, which is let's get the kind of a two birds with one stone approach, which is show that stuff, but cycle through it. And then once you're past it, you can sort of get to the meat of the emotional story, which is 
how do you come back from something like that? And once you've been able to process it somewhat, not saying you're completely over it because that takes a long, long time, but once you're past the immediate heartbreak, the immediate anger, the immediate rebellion, and in this case, partying, what's the next step? And so I think that was the sort of, I think somewhat of a savvy move was just to move us forward in time, like you said, and get her to the point where she can be making more sort of cognizant decisions about what she's going to do next. Right. You know, and with what comes next, what works so well throughout the entire arc of the first season is the fact that you're not keeping her stagnant. It's not, oh, this woman's out of touch and isn't that funny because to play that same joke would wear thin, but you really have her have these evolutions and these changes episode by episode, you know, and and she's not going to become a different person completely overnight. And some of that side of her is never going to completely go away, but she is kind of coming into a more selfless space episode by episode. And so how did you, how did you kind of create how much of an arc you wanted to have episode by episode to make sure that the audience is always feeling that change being drawn in and connecting more to the character but also kind of setting it up in a way where it's not a complete resolution by the end of season one because you obviously want to have future seasons of the show as well yeah we definitely were very deliberate about molly's character's path in every episode and we wanted to really through interacting with the other characters sort of typified most by Sophia, you know, we wanted the show to be to some degree about the push and pull, but like between these two women, you know, um, who are trying to figure each other out. And by the beginning of the season, don't entirely trust each other, but come to a really nice conclusion by the end where they are, they really need each other to do what they want to do. Um, And so every episode, we talked about, you know, taking Molly a couple steps forward in her understanding of sort of what she's lost and what she can gain and sticking it out with these people. You know, I think we think of the character of Molly of like that core is good, but it's just been surrounded by this cloud of sort of, you know, rich person idiocy for so long, you know, Uh, and it's about digging that out, you know, but I think you're also right to say, it can't just go away because you still want Molly to be funny and still make mistakes and still struggle, have that internal struggle of like, but I do really like my giant house. I know it's probably too big, but there are things about it that I like, uh, which, you know, I think everybody kind of goes through, you know, where their morals uh, get in the way of their sort of baser uh, instincts. And that struggle is like a fun one. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it really takes a lot of conversation, a lot of rewriting and sort of assessment of what the correct pacing of her journey is and her evolution. Uh, Just, you know, this is not really a spoiler. Something happens in the finale of the season that at a certain point we thought would happen in the pilot. We thought, you know, and and that was too fast. So, um, you know, you really sort of want to savor the journey. You know, you think about, sometimes I think we think about a show like Breaking Bad, right? You know, Vince Gilligan, the showrunner of that show said, this is the story of, you know, Mr. Chips becoming Scarface. You just have to pace it out perfectly, right? He, he has to be innocent at the beginning and then, you know, become a monster by the end. But you have to see those steps along the way. This is kind of the opposite journey. She's not Scarface at the beginning, but she's someone who's out of touch and sort of doesn't understand the world outside her own bubble. And this show is about her awakening towards that. And you were bringing up the character Sophia as well, played by Michaela J. Rodriguez, wonderfully. And I love, I love kind of the push and pull between the two of them, um, you know, and the way that they both kind of come towards the center, you know, no one's taking a wild swing over to the other character's world, but they're kind of meeting in the middle and in different ways. And so did you see the the development of Molly as always being a calibration alongside Sophia, because they're, they're both kind of going through these separate journeys that are very connected to each other? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, from day one, we felt like that was the heart of the show um, because there is not just an ideological move to the center, but there's an emotional move towards these two people who couldn't be more different in terms of their backgrounds, their lifestyles, their philosophies. And it's so cool, in our opinion, to build a show around that sort of philosophical difference two people who shouldn't like each other, but deep down, we're a little bit of softies in their respect. We were, we think they're, they're good people. And we actually think this is a show about very, a very different group of people, all of whom are good people deep down, but have different life experiences and different worldviews. And it's about them coming together and finding that common ground, especially in the case of Sophia and Molly. 
And, you know, that was one of the tricks was Maya is such a likable performer. You know, I can't think of anyone else in the world who could have played this part in the way she does, which is you have this very, in many ways, unlikable character with a lot of unlikable traits, but you can tell she doesn't mean it in that way, right? You can tell there's probably someone good deep down inside. And I think that's what kind of Sophia sees as well. As all as, as frustrated as Sophia is, I think she can see this deep down inside of Molly. And by the same token, Molly's very frustrated by Sophia's rigidity and her moral code and her sort of, you know, that can be frustrating in its own way. But I think they both you know, are on the path to at least a mutual respect for each other's worldviews. I think that's what we, I love so much about writing workplace comedies is you can take two people who, if they were not forced together by this job, would never spend a minute with each other, <laughs> right? Especially when they start off because they just don't see eye to eye. And it's so fun to write two people who just have just fundamentally when they meet different views of the world and what's important in their frame of reference is so different uh, and see hopefully in an optimistic way that these people can come together, right? And, be in, and fix things about the other person that maybe need to be fixed, which is so fun to write. And the kind of thing that dynamic is if you can get it right is just what you need for for like a, a good comedy I think yeah yeah you know and, and you're using characteristic traits that are evolving in these characters but you're also really using language in a very specific way in the writing so if we take Sophia as a character at the beginning it's I don't need anything from from Molly's world you know why would we why would we take advantage of any of these things that's not how I operate in my world and then you know cut to a few episodes in she's very very specifically ordering a very detailed cocktail at a bar and that's something that she wouldn't have done earlier right. and so how did you want to use language to be very specific about these journeys of the characters as well. Yeah, I, I think that's very perceptive. I, I mean, thank you for watching that that closely. <laughs> we really appreciate it. But but you know, one of the things that we really tried to take into account with Sophia's character, and by the way, Michaela brought so much to it because we had sort of designed this character as someone who's very principled and you know maybe not so good with people. But once we decided to cast Michaela J, it unlocked a whole new element and and really made Sophia a likable character because that's it's very easy to fall into a pitfall, a trap of making that character a scold or a stick in the mud or someone who's not any fun. And it's like Michaela J is fun, like you know, like you like, like there's a fun element to her. So even when she's telling people what to do and what's what's right and what's wrong you understand where it's coming from. You understand where that character's coming from, why that character has the worldview they have. And so one of the things we thought early on was, what if, is there something interesting about the idea that Sophia is really educated and knows about what's best for the world on a global level, but maybe isn't so good at a one-on-one -on -one personal level. And it happens that Molly's actually better at that than she is. And so over the course of the series, can Sophia learn a little bit more about the world, first of all, but also a little bit more about how to interact with people one-on-one, -on -one. something that Molly, from all her years of cocktail parties and glad handing and, you know, being in these conference rooms with John, you know, that she has a little bit more strength. So, so we definitely wanted to be a situation where both characters could learn something from each other. When we pitched them, we said it can be Kirk and Spock. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. The empath and the person who knows everything. Right. And that was a model we used, honestly, as, as stupid as that sounds. Yeah. When we were writing them, you know, like we knew that that was how they had to uh, interact with each other. Yeah. And, but, and, and, but how much more interesting is it when Kirk is Maya Rudolph and Spock's Michael <laughs> yeah. Rodriguez? Right. That's, that, that, you know, look, you start from that theoretical, yeah. but then when you cast the people, like, oh, wow. Spock as played by Michaela J. That's interesting. You know, that then it starts getting really rich. So that's that that was really exciting for us. Yeah, I love that. I love that analogy so much. And it's so fitting for them when you step back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and you were talking right at the beginning as well about some of the production design elements and obviously having your team be like, okay, and now we're in Thailand and now we're in this country and, and changing that up. And I and I so I, I was actually very genuinely interested in what were the challenges and how did you overcome the logistical elements of creating and telling a story that's about this character that, as you described before, is, is the 1% of the 1%. And obviously you don't have the 1% of the 1% budget in making yes. the show, but you have to make us feel, you know, 
the exuberance of her home, you know, the stuff that she's got there. And there's kind of great cheats, like having David Chang as her chef, you know, says so much about how much she must be paying him in order for him to be there and not running his restaurants. In um, and so how did you find lots of creative workarounds like that, where you could work something into the story, you could kind of visually cheat something in order to make it still feel that way for the audience? Uh, wow. I mean, first of all, we got to give credit to our production designer, Jennifer Dagon, and our, our cinematographer, Mark Schwartzbard. They, we lean on them so much because we could always write, you know, we could always location scout and find, you know, a place that simulates somewhere. But it really, you know, falls to the art department and the camera department to really just bring that vision to life and make it all work. And, and in some cases, they did a better job. It was like, oh, man, this this exceeds our expectations. This is really selling the location. But you're right. It's all cheats like that. Right. Like, you know, hey, we we don't have spoiler or I don't know, Easter egg. We don't have a five hundred million dollar yacht. What we do have a re really expensive speedboat. So that's a VFX shot, you know, so but we did shoot at a two hundred million dollar mansion. So there are things where like there's some real there's some sort of cheats, but it's it's trying to be creative with it and trying to be funny, like you said. Right. It's it's you know, we don't just want this to be a show like, hey, it's it's there's a little bit of wish fulfillment of I'm seeing mansions and private jets and stuff. But like, we also want to be like, we want to make fun of that world as well. So that like, like you mentioned the David Chang stuff or the sting stuff or having seal perform at her birthday party. Like that, those are all things that like, okay, can we try to make this stuff funny? And, 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 and we kind of, kind of put a spin on it as opposed to just showing rich person stuff, which by the way, you're right. It's hard to do on the budget of a television show, especially half hour comedy. So we're trying to do our best. There's there's a million challenges. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah that's like, all, I mean, helicopters, yeah. planes. <laughs> I will say we did have one thing dropped in our lap, not dropped in our lap, but it was exciting. There's a house where Molly lives that's called the One that's in Bel Air, and it's so almost like legendary in Los Angeles as one of the most expensive houses that was ever built. And they built it, and no one was living there at the time, and it was like. They were like, you guys can shoot here. And it was perfect. We saw so many houses that a millionaire would live in, but then yeah. we walked into the one. It was like, this is a house a billionaire lives in. And um, it was incredible. I mean, it was a hundred thousand square foot house, I think. Yeah. It had a nightclub. We, it, we, 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 there, there's stuff, there's stuff in the house <laughs> yeah. we didn't see. There's six swimming pools, there's a nightclub, there's a bowling alley. There's there, there's we we shot there for a week and you there's still more of the house you haven't seen. So yeah. We're, we're hoping, you know, we'll see if we're lucky enough to get a season two. I believe the house is still, it, it just got bought, but no one lives there yet, I think. So that was that was one of the crazy things. And, and the other part is how fun it is to make a show about this world in some ways, because there are challenges you don't anticipate. Like I remember making Molly's jet, right? So we had to plan about, okay, again, this isn't just a billionaire's jet. This is a basically a hundred billionaire's jet. So we're like, she has essentially a 737. <laughs> like she has, a, like, this is, this is not like a Learjet or, or you know, it, it's, a, it's literally like a repurposed passenger plane. And so we built it, Jennifer Dagon, our, our production designer and her team built this jet. And then we had a scene where they had turbulence and, and, and we're, and we're like, we need to put this up on what's called a gimbal. And so we, we put it up on a machine that is able to prop up the entire private plane set and make it move around. And, that that was its whole other thing. And, and that's the other thing where you, you, you know, you love the logistics of it in some way, because I went on, I was directing this episode. I went on YouTube and found all these different plane crash turbulence scenes. And the one that felt closest was almost famous. It's like, okay, it's scary, but it's a little funny. And like, you get it. And so I sent it as reference and our alarm producer, our line producer, Chris Eber was like, we can get the machine from almost famous. So I was like, great. So we got the same machine. We put the private jet set on there. And then to show the cast that it was safe, I wrote it and they shot a video of me riding in the jet. And then we shot the scene. But yeah, that, and, and by the way, the actors made it really funny because we had them improvise and just make up a whole bunch of stuff when the, when the plane was crashing. So. No, that's that's such an amazing amazing detail for it. And with with the house, if there's a season two and Molly moves, I'll be like, someone moved into the house. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, it'll probably be a slightly smaller mansion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'll be like I really downsize and yes. it'll be seventy five thousand yes. square feet. It's Iron yeah. Man's it's house. house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, you know, and, and Matt, obviously, you were describing earlier that this is in essence, um, you know, a lot of the setup is is a workplace comedy. But again, we get to kind of create those characters in that sort of pressure cooker situation where they wouldn't be around each other. But then because their relationships develop and grow, there's a lot of situations where even beyond 
work situations where they're leaving the office, they're starting to spend a lot more time outside together, you know, and sometimes it's because they're going on a, a private Jane private jet, you know, and sometimes it's because we're meeting Howard's girlfriend for the first time story-wise. And so how do you kind of determine narratively where it really makes sense to take these characters and take them outside of that bubble and what the external forces are going to be that are going to really add to the story or tell us something new about that particular character because you've paid so much attention and care to all of the supporting characters just as much as you have to Sophia and Molly. Yeah, it, 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 it was, it's a, true balance because we really were interested in people who are trying to make the world a better place through the charity space and all the challenges that come along with that. But we also, I think, knew for the many years we've worked on these types of shows that to relate to these people, you also have to understand like what their personal lives are like. So we did a lot of work to try to make sure that you were learning what their hopes and dreams and challenges were outside of work, right? Any great workplace comedy does that. And so quickly with Nicholas, we thought like, okay, he has this secret dream that he's embarrassed about. Uh, and we thought Howard would be a good character just because he's so optimistic to start to pull that out of him, even though he doesn't want to talk about it. And he's very walled off in some ways. And in reverse, you know, we wanted Howard. I feel like I know many kind, wonderful, nice people who are in bad relationships with their significant other because they can't shut things down when they're supposed to. And we pretty quickly knew that Ron and Joel were going to be very funny together. And it just like seemed like this is the kind, this is another access that we can spend time on. Um, and so we wanted that to get like more personal. And obviously with Arthur and Molly, we wanted them to be in a place where they had both gone through a divorce. So the, so although they are very different types of people, they could bond over that. So it's like, we almost spend, I feel like we spend like 75% of our time talking about who these people are and who their lives are. And often we will try to come up with a workplace problem that, that reveals something about that. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult, but uh, it, I, I think it's like, it gets to things that make people love these characters, hopefully. Yeah, I, I think that's the balance, right? You want to keep, it's almost like a juggling act. You want to keep the overall arc of the season intact and you want to, you don't want to give short shrift to the actual job they're doing, which is very important, but you can't have every episode be about, you know, boring procedural stuff or writing checks or, you know, so it needs to be a balance between the two. And um, ideally you can, again, do kind of two birds with one stone, but uh, yeah, we really wanted each character to have an arc over the course of the season. And, and yeah, the Nicholas uh, Howard relationship is really fun. We, we sometimes talked about it. It's like a, if a cat and a dog became friends and it's like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, they're just, it, it's just, we find that story really cute and they're so funny together. So um, they team up at the end. They, they, they're so great together in all of their scenes. And, you know, and, and lastly, because obviously you were, you were talking there about it is a comedy, but you're also using the show to explore some of the challenges for people working in the charity space, some of the hypocrisies that, that come into that world as well. From, from people that you talked to and some of the research that you did in developing the show, what were the most important things that you wanted to be able to touch upon? And then how did you find the avenues into how you were going to do that in a comedic way where it's not didactic for the audience? Yeah, that was very interesting because I actually didn't know that much about the charity, the ph ph philanthropy world when we got into this and um, tried to do some research. We talked to some a lot of people who worked in that space and um, there's a lot of different theories on how this should be done. There's something like uh, what the Bill Gates Foundation does, which is like this huge organization which oversees things from a very top down level. There's organizations which I think like Sophia agrees more with, start from the bottom up. She says at some point to Molly, give people money who are doing the work and are on the ground. And that tension uh, is an important one. And I, I, I don't think we know what's right or how's the right way to do this, but we thought that was an interest, th that sort of how do we make things better for people was like a really interesting, challenging problem in this world that we thought could be fun to sort of explore uh, in the show, you know? Yeah, and, and we saw the show as kind of like a 90-10, 95-5, like fun show to watch. And then, hey, if you're paying attention, there's there's a little bit of, uh, of an idea behind this. And we never want it to be preachy or like you said, didactic. It's more like, well, this is 
kind of what we've read about and we're presenting what these characters might have their philosophies be in the show. So, um, you know, hopefully people get pick up on a little bit of that stuff and it's not, you know, it doesn't feel like medicine. We really feel like we wanted to make a fun, funny show. It's been a crazy few years for the world and we just wanted to give people something that hopefully brings them a little bit of a joy and, and, and can bring a little laughter in their lives. So um, that was the main focus. But yeah, a little bit of an idea about, uh, about our, you know, where our society is as well. So. No, you, you've absolutely achieved what you set out to in terms of how you wanted to tell the story. The first season's so great. And I cross my fingers that we get more seasons of the show. Thank you so much, Alan and Matt. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank, thank you. you.